Well, welcome back to the Art of the Matter, and more importantly, welcome to the season of Advent, which starts this Sunday. Advent is a season of waiting and watching, of looking forward to the coming of Christ. And that coming of Christ that we long for exists on three levels. We look forward to celebrating the birth of Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, as it occurred in Bethlehem over 2,000 years ago. We look forward to and long for a greater presence of Jesus in our lives here and now, signs of him appearing in our midst in this present moment. And as today's gospel reading suggests, we look forward to his coming in glory at some unknown time and place in the future. This is when Jesus comes both in glory and in judgment, and today's passage encourages us, beware, be alert, for you do not know when that time will come. Twice he admonishes us, keep awake. Let's take a look at today's reading from Mark chapter 13. But in those days following that distress, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky, and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, people will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that it is near, right at the door. Truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. But about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, be alert. You do not know when that time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with their assigned task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. During the Middle Ages particularly, there was a very heavy emphasis on this coming day of judgment the day of Christ's return. Almost every cathedral built at that time had a scene of the last judgment carved in the tympanum above the doorway of the church as you entered, and frequently there would be a painted image of this scene on the interior of the church designed so it would be one of the last things you saw as you exited the building. Notre Dame in Paris represents this typical decorative scheme very well. Obviously, these pictures are before the tragic fire. We'll focus on the main entrance to the cathedral and the arched portion called the tympanum above. This is what you see directly above your head as you enter the building. Moving in more closely, we see Christ throned in glory flanked by the Virgin Mary on the left and St. John on the right, praying for the people below, as angels who hold the cross and spear, which remind the viewer that Christ died for us. If we then take a look at the area just below this scene, we see St. Michael holding the scales in which souls are weighed and a variety of devils 
trying to pull the scale down so that they can pluck the soul being weighed off to hell. On the right, we see a group of people chained together and being pulled and herded along by beast-like devils. And the people include priests and popes, kings and commoners. Hell is in fact an equal opportunity resting place. If we go to the next layer below this, in architectural terms, it's called the lintel, we see the dead rising helter-skelter from their graves as they are soon to be weighed in St. Michael's scales. So at this time in the Middle Ages, the return of Christ and the Last Judgment was kept in the forefront of people's minds in an effort to emphasize what the future held, blessing or curse. Be on your guard. Keep awake, as Jesus says, because this day might come at any moment and you don't want your soul to be found wanting. The same message carried over into the early Renaissance. The oil painting technique brought to such perfection by the Van Eck brothers in 1432 when the Ghent altarpiece was finished, immediately gained ardent followers and imitators. What you are looking at is by Hans Memling from about 1470. Your eye moves upward in a semicircular pattern from the left, where souls are being resurrected from the ground, upwards to the souls being led to heaven, then to Christ, seated at the top of the semicircle, surrounded by the apostles, then to the right and down, to the unfortunate souls who are falling head down into hell. This semicircular movement holds the composition together across all three panels of the triptych. The central panel shows Christ enthroned with the world as his footstool, sitting atop a rainbow. Light streams out from behind him to the top of the frame. Christ, his apostles, and the angels are separated from the action taking place below by a band of dark clouds. In the lower half of the panel, St. Michael, dressed as a soldier or a knight, wields the cross of Christ and the all-important scale where souls are being weighed. Notice that St. Michael's wings taper off into meticulously crafted peacock feathers and many of the various devils have wings of butterflies, bats, and other flying creatures. The attention to detail in this work rivals Van Eck, who led the way in this kind of precision. Let's take a look at some of the groups surrounding St. Michael here. Here we have an angel who is seemingly in a tug of war with the devil for the soul of this person. The souls depicted on the right are the damned who will be sent to hell. If we examine their expressions more closely, we see that in their agony and terror, they are crying very beautifully painted tears. And each person is given a very individual face and expression. These amazing tears are a brilliant example of how oil paint lends itself to the depiction of transparency and shining light. The left-hand panel depicts heaven, which is conceived as an incredibly ornate Gothic cathedral, and Memling employs the grisaille technique we've talked about before to render the stone of the building in a very realistic way. One could linger over these details for hours, but we won't. From the top down, you have the musical angels, and below them, the angels who are busy welcoming the souls of the blessed into heaven, and dressing each person with a beautiful garment. Until this moment, all the souls we have seen have been naked as you see here. 
The right-hand panel shows us the damned falling into hell, where they are poked and prodded by demons who wield red-hot weapons of torture. As we've seen before, artists get very inventive and let their imaginations soar when they're painting evil. The souls of the damned and the demons who torture them hold a certain dark fascination, even though they're grotesque in every respect. What a brilliantly hideous vision of hell Memling gives us. Again, the message is clear and very much in keeping with today's lectionary reading. Be on your guard. Be awake. Judgment is coming at an hour that you don't know, and you certainly want to be found on the side of the angels, not the demons. Something disturbs me, though, if we only look forward to Jesus' return with a case of high anxiety, as if it were bad news. Because Jesus comes not just in judgment. He comes as a tiny baby, Emmanuel, God with us, who comes precisely so that through our faith in him, we're spared the judgment that we otherwise might deserve. And that is very good news indeed. And he comes to dwell within us, changing us, bringing light into our own spiritual darkness. We need an image of that, too. In coming weeks, I'll be showing you a number of beautiful images of the Annunciation and of John the Baptist preparing the way for Jesus. But today, I want to share just one image of Mary with you that absolutely captivates me. It's by a painter of the early Renaissance named Antonella de Messina or Antonello from Messina in Sicily. Early on in his career, he arrived in Naples, Italy, and it's there that he came into contact with the painting of Jan van Eyck and his followers of the ne Netherlandish school of painting. As we saw with van Eyck and the Ghent altarpiece, this school of painting favored the use of oil paints and focused on highly detailed precise images. You can see that in his depiction of St. Jerome in his study, as well as in his self-portrait, or what appears to be his self-portrait. Effects of light and transparency and reflection were some of the major characteristics of this school, and you can certainly see all that at play in this small panel painting of St. Jerome. But his painting called The Virgin Annunciate really is something else. Yes, the picture has been damaged over the centuries and could no doubt do with a good cleaning. But try to set that aside for a moment. Look at the way the light falls so delicately on her face, defining her eyelids and brows, her nose, her cheeks, and the tiniest hint of a smile. In more muted tones, it defines the neck under her chin and moves down to a bright spot on the right side of her chest before it is hidden by her cloak. See how the light shapes the cloak and gives it its satiny texture. The light falls perfectly on her hands one holding her cloak protectively together, the other just slightly raised and exquisitely foreshortened as she acknowledges the presence of someone or something that has appeared before her. Finally, the light rests on the lectern and on the open pages of her devotional book. All our attention is captured by this singular pyramidal figure which rises out of total darkness. This is a really, really unusual portrait of Mary. I know of no other painting of the Virgin that pictures her in such complete solitude, with nothing but darkness as a background, and no accompanying 
persons or accoutrements. To my mind, this is a wonderful image of waiting in patient readiness, being on the alert, being in spiritual watch mode. The coming of the visitor whom she is beginning to acknowledge does not take her by surprise. We don't see her visitor. In fact, we, the viewer, are in the position her visitor would take. Her visitor is presumably the angel Gabriel, about to reveal God's plan for her to bear his son, if she is willing. And it's from this angelic figure that the light comes to illuminate Mary. We have been allowed to be inside this incredibly intimate moment, to witness what it's like to be waiting and watching on the alert for the sudden presence of God in our lives. Perhaps this can be the image we carry with us throughout Advent, reminding us to be on the alert and awake, always looking for the ways that Jesus is present in our lives right now, even as we look forward to celebrating his birth at Christmas and his second coming in glory. So, welcome to Advent, our season of watching. Be alert, be observant, and be ready to be surprised by joy. And I'll see you next week.